really exciting to be here today. I want to say thank you, first of all, to the great people at LTA who worked so hard over the last 10 years to get to the point where we're at today. And today, I'm going to tell you about the story of Pathfinder 1 and where we're going. We are fortunate to stand on the shoulders of giants. And in particular, I focus on Carl Arnstein, the chief engineer of Goodyear Zeppelin. He started off at Zeppelin in 1915 and moved to Akron, Ohio in 1924 to form this joint company that led to the Akron and the Macon, which I'm showing here. The middle chart, or the middle airship on the chart, is an AIAA paper from 1993 entitled The Largest Cargo Airship That Would Fit It, Moffett Field, Hangar 1. And we also looked at these as the basis for our own thoughts. That genesis led to the two airships on the bottom there, which I refer to as the Big Bird. Rather than bite that off right away, we decided to build a technology demonstrator, and I'm showing you here the evolution of Pathfinder 1, where we played with the size and length, the, the configuration of the tails, and the shape and the propulsion. So here it is. We have four electric motors on either side, solar on the top. We've got four fins in a kind of an X. The top fins are slightly more counted towards the middle. And we've got a gondola at the bottom and two wheels. I'm going to run you through the anatomy of Pathfinder 1. We've embraced the use of deep self-supporting mainframes. These were used by the Akron and the Macon and the R101. They are like the ribs of the whale. They're the building blocks. The nice thing about these is that you can attach large loads into them very easily. We then attach the hull structure. And here we are putting on everything else, the gondola, the fins, the propulsion system, the helium bags, the outer cover. This shows you a comparison of Pathfinder 1 to pressure airships that have been built in the last 50 years. So looking into Pathfinder 1, I came up with the idea of using a carbon fiber tube, a monolithic tube, as a building block. And that's what we are doing, and it works. We're using titanium connectors, and here's a comparison. If you go to Friedrichshafen and visit Zeppelin, you'll see the joint from the Zeppelin in the lobby. It's beautiful. It's elegant, but the, oh my, it's complicated. And so I really feel that what we've done here is come up with a solution that is way easier to build and assemble, and it's very light as well. So it's a little bit more on the anatomy. We've got gangways at the top and the bottom that allow us to crawl around the airship, giving us access to various systems. There's a tunnel that takes you to the top. We have a bunch of sensors on the top, including LIDARs that measure the volume of the helium bags. This is something that has never been done before, but it gives the pilots real-time knowledge of how much lift there is in every single bag. We have 13 gas cells with gas valves, two gas valves per gas cell, a bunch of strain gauges. Now I'm going to talk about the build. On the top left, there is a universal mainframe jig, which I like to call it the jig to bind them all. It's one jig that binds all of the mainframes, and every single mainframe built in this jig is done in a day. In the top middle is the nose jig. It's, I call it the creature from the swamp because the, the nose kind of grows out of the ground. The top right is a heated clamp that accelerates securing. We've also developed a robotic welding cell. So here is the uh, robotic weld cell. This is our most complicated joint being welded by uh, a pair of robots. This is called the snowflake. It's got 11 tubes coming into one place. The benefit of this welding approach is it gives you better weld penetration, which gives you better reliability and longevity. Here's the way that they made mainframes back in the day. This is the build of the Akron in the air dock in 1932. And here is our universal mainframe jig in operation at Hangar 2 at Moffett Field. Again, these mainframes are the building blocks of the airship, and we've done this about 20 times. Every time we've done this, we've built a mainframe in a day. When I see pictures like this, I'm terrified. What would it have been like to be at the end of one of those ladders? And this kind of captures the, the challenge of how airships were made in the past. When you look at this, there's got to be a better way that is faster, better, cheaper, and safer. I'm going to talk a bit about something called the roller coaster that will 
dramatically change the production of large rigid airships. So this challenge led us to the roller coaster. It's a cradle that we put the mainframes into and then we connect the whole structure to it while standing on the ground. We then do a 180 degree rotation to align and lock in the mainframes to be parallel. So this was a test section that we built before we built the flight vehicle. We have a strong practice of build and test and build and test and build and test and break and build and test. So we, we've made a lot of these mainframes, I think about 20 or so, and we've broken a lot of them to make sure that they meet our specifications. And I'm going to quickly run you through the build. So, this is the second mainframe being built, connected. Here, we demonstrate what I call the double barrel, where we're connecting mainframe 3 to mainframe 4 and mainframe 5 to mainframe 6. This, in effect, doubles our production capacity. We believe using methods like this, we can assemble the airframe in weeks, not years, which will enable large-scale manufacturing. We've demonstrated this at this size, but we've also demonstrated at a larger size, which I'm going to show to you in a minute. This is kind of an extraordinary thing to see uh, in real life. This hasn't been done before with airships, but it's a game changer. It's a breakthrough technology for manufacturing because of the acceleration and the safety aspects of this. Here, 30 people can build an airship that used to take 1,000. The creature from the swamp. We grow the nose out of the ground. And so this was the theory that, was, that we've developed. And it seemed like a great idea, and we've proven it. We've proven it. So this is Hangar 2 at Moffat Field. It wasn't in very good shape when I first moved in in 2016. The um, roof was leaking. The place was dark, dirty, the floor wasn't painted. Um, so we put a lot of improvements in. Uh, our landlord, of course, has done a lot of improvements as well. But it's now um, really a great place to work. This took, um, I think, about three days to do. We built the nose, and then we put it into our mainframe jig and built it into mainframe two, which we then attached to the airship. So here the nose is going into the airship. That red tripod mask came to us from Goodyear in Pompano Beach in Florida. They weren't using it anymore. So we tore it to pieces and shipped it out and we uh, furbished it. And it's now balancing the nose in place because otherwise the nose would fall over. And then we connected the nose to the, the rest of the airframe. And that's the bottom gangway. So we got gangways going from mainframe 2 to mainframe 13. We have bulkheads at each mainframe. And then we continue to build out the structure of the, the, the connection between 2 and 3. We built the tail cone, which is an assembly of four thrust vectoring electric motors, and then completed the assembly of the airframe. We then started attaching the skin and the fins in the final rotation. The skin is made out of Tedlar and Technora. Here we are, completing the airship skin and fin installation. The white covers on the mainframes protect the gas bags from rubbing against the mainframes. So the gas cells are made out of polyurethane with a ripstop. We've played around with different approaches on, on gas cells. Um, we, we looked at EVOH, which was the material used by Loon for a while. We looked at other suppliers, but uh, ultimately we partnered with TCOM and ILC Dover, and, and TCOM was, was here today. And so thank you. Um, here you see them hanging from the ceiling. This hasn't been done in 85 years. And the very first time we did this, it, it was problematic. One of our suppliers said, look Al, here's the way you raise a gas bag. This is a lost art. It sounds trivial, it isn't. It's taken us a while
to figure out how to do this and do it safely and do it well. After we installed the gas bags, we performed our first float. So here, the airship is an empty shell, but it's got all the gas bags in about half full, and we relocated to a new position to complete the integration of all of the rest of the hardware. So we then drove the airship through the hangar to a new location. We needed to do this to get uh, out of the way of the ceiling so that the landlord could put in some fire detectors. Seeing the airship move is in itself a wondrous thing. It's something to, to behold. We then completed the integration of the build of the vehicle with all of the electrical uh, hardware. This is the world's first electric airship that carries people. I know there are small airships that, um, and we built some, that, that don't carry people that are electric. This is the first all electric airship that actually carries people. And because we have 12 electric motors and we've got uh, 24 batteries and other things, there's a lot of wires. And so one of the biggest challenges has been making sure that all of the wires are there and that they are built to spec everything's connected correctly, and so this is what we were doing here. When we started the project, Zeppelin was a key partner, and I'm really grateful to them. They strongly recommended that we do not do what we did. They did said, don't do electric propulsion. That's, that's a bridge too far. You should use our Lycomans. So, we went to a hybrid solution. We pivoted in 2019 working again with Zeppelin and with Vertigo to come up with an approach that would give us the legs. So now we have five diesel, or actually we're using Jet A, fuel tanks. Each one carries a ton of fuel, which represents about a thousand nautical miles. And we've got two Vertigo gensets, which um, both either of them generate 150 kilowatts. Either can generate enough power for, for us. The Propulsion comes from Pipistrel. It's the Alpha Electro, and we're showing it here with a two meter propeller and integrated into the, uh, the mainframe. We built a family of what I call baby airships. Why? Ultimately, we are using them to test out the flight software. We built four of them, three have been flying. Fourth is, uh, we built the, the structure, we haven't flown it yet. But the, the third airship, Baby Airship 3.0, has become a critical tool for us to validate our flight software. The picture here, or the video here, is taken in the Akron Air Dock, which we bought uh, a few years ago. Uh, it had seen, um, it wasn't in such good shape when we first moved in, but as you can see, we've cleaned it up and this is where we're planning on um, large-scale manufacturing uh, in the future. After we had completed that, we did our first systems checkout, which we call Spin the Prop. So here, the pilots are actually flying the vehicle, except we're still in the scaffold. So the pilots are, all of them, the propulsion units are pointing forward. These are pusher propellers, and this is our first time where everything has been integrated from the, finger, from the fingers of the pilots to the propellers spinning. So we went through a series of sequence of slowly building up speed um, and to, we didn't actually spin them that fast. We only spun them at 500 RPM. We didn't want to push the airship too hard because it was still in the scaffolding. There's one shot of the tail I want you to see, so four on each side and four at the tail. We then moved the airship from the south end of the hangar to the north end of the hangar. In the background, you'll see an A170. That was the MZ3 Alpha, the old Navy airship that uh, has, I think is about to leave the hangar. We were using that as a training airship for ground crew and, and, uh, and pilots. So here, we've now got the gondola and everything integrated, and we're moving to our launch position. You can also see the orange and white tripod mast here. This was also built by uh, Joe Gibbs Racing. We gave them a kind of a sketch and they, they, they completed it. It's one that we're gonna use at Moffat Field. And here is our very first flight. We originally 
we were thinking that this was going to be more of a hop, but um, our pilots were so pleased with the stability and control of the flight control system that with the encouragement of the flight test program manager, we actually flew for five minutes. It was extraordinary. So this is the largest airship and the first rigid airship of its kind in 85 years. So this is a moment of history and one that I hope will launch a new age of airships. In the hangar where we work, there's a sign that says, it's a great day to build an airship. That sign has now changed. It now says, it's a great day to fly an airship. Um, initially flying around Moffat Field, KMUQ, and then around the Bay Area, and then farther afield. They're going to be sustainable, and they're going to use carbon-free propulsion. Thank you so much for your time today. Up ship!